Hi, everyone. My name is Ren Liu. I'm a software engineer based in New York City, and I've been with the company about a year and a half. Uh, before Uber, I was uh, getting my master's in computer science at Columbia, and I also have a bachelor's in math from Harvard. Uh, during my first year at Uber, I was a data scientist on Fran Bell's team. I think you guys heard earlier from Fran. She's awesome. Um, and then October, I moved to New York, and I joined Observability Applications, again, as a software engineer. So a lot of you guys might be wondering what exactly is observability, let alone observability applications. And I'm happy to inform you that if you are a service owner and you have ever received a 3M page telling you that your service is unhealthy, then you are likely to be reacting to or interacting with services that my team has maintained and built. And today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what we're doing to make that process faster, smarter, and more automated for you guys. So as Amy mentioned, and most of you guys probably know, Uber today is a company with a lot of scope. We're in over 500 cities. We own over uh, 2,000 microservices, and we run them out of multiple data centers around the world. And together, these services emit over 500 million unique telemetry time series. So these are things like counts of errors, uh, requests per second, and P99 conditions. And taken all together, they give us a pretty reasonable look into the health of our systems. So in the case of an outage, our errors will rise, our successful requests will fall, and this will create what's called an anomaly in a time series. So currently, observability at Uber is kind of a mosh pit of services. So if you're a service owner and you want to do what's called white box monitoring, you need to first emit your metrics to your in-house telemetry system called M3 or time series database. And then you need to go to our in-house alert configuration system called uMonitor um, to actually configure alerts. And this involves having to set reasonable thresholds on your metrics. So that might involve having to go to our third party metrics dashboard Grafana and eyeballing what exactly is reasonable for this metric. Then when you actually do get a page, you have to maybe rifle through thousands of events in our events database called P3. And then maybe you get around to eventually filing a, a commander incident. So that's our outage communications platform. You know, and in, in the very small percentage of cases, maybe you also get around to writing a postmortem. So as you can tell, a lot of this process is pretty manual, right? You have to manually emit your metrics. You have to manually configure your alerts. You man, you have to manually do root cause detection. And so as an organization, I think in 2017, a lot of observability has been about making that process more automated. And there's a lot of projects sort of marching towards this goal, but the one that I want to talk to you guys about today is called Merrill, uh, which is short for Metric Reliability Layer. And it has to do with automatically selecting the best algorithm for anomaly detection. So something I've sort of glossed over until now is that some amount of stuff has already been automated. So in particular, if you're a service owner whose metrics are seasonal, that is, they have a weekly pattern or a daily pattern, um, they're cyclical, a lot of pool metrics or business type metrics are like this, then you can make use of an algorithm called F3, um, which was developed by the IDS, Intelligent Decision Systems team, based in San Francisco. And this algorithm is accessible via the alert configuration UI. And what it does is it basically looks at historical week over week data and trains a set of dynamic thresholds that are appropriate. Um, another option is a change point detection algorithm called JNCP. So change point detection algorithms uh, detect shifts in the generative parameters of a time series. So if you assume that a time series are basically ordered, time-stamped data points drawn from some kind of distribution, say a normal distribution, then this distribution is parameterized by certain parameters, so in the Gaussian case by a mean and a variance. And so change point detection algorithms as a family will find those shifts and those changes, changes in mean, changes in variance, changes in independence sometimes. Um, and so they generally work by windowing iteratively across the time series and then performing a series of statistical tests. So as you can tell, like some amount of progress has been made towards a point where eventually as a service owner, you don't have to do anything and your metric is already automatically tracked. Sort of what we're lacking to get from here to there, though, is that 
basically, as a service owner, even though you're a lay person, you're expected to be able to determine accurately which, which of these algorithms, so F3 or change point or other anomaly detection algorithms, are actually appropriate for your metric. And that's where Merrill, metric reliability layer, now comes in. So Merrill sort of solves this problem by essentially producing a set of Merrill scores. So a high Merrill score corresponds to high confidence that this particular algorithm is gonna perform well in this particular metric. And with a low score, it's the opposite. Oh, sorry. So Merrill is a uh, bootstrapped backtesting framework. So in an ideal world, to sort of figure out this problem, we would love to be able to run all algorithms over all metrics in production. But there are some obvious obstacles to this, right? We don't want to just spam on-call engineers with spurious alerts during an experimentation phase, and we also have no guarantees that sort of outages, which are by nature special events, are gonna give us good coverage over the 500 million metrics. And so Merrill instead turns to statistical bootstrapping theory which allows us to estimate certain properties of an estimator, so in this case, an F2 score, which is a combination of precision and recall, um, by essentially sampling repeatedly with replacement. So in particular and in practice, what that means is that we take a time series and we inject a synthetic anomaly into it. And then we run the algorithm over this newly modified time series, and we do this hundreds of times with synthetic anomalies of varying durations and sizes. The point is that so you have this time series with the synthetic anomaly in it, and you do this hundreds of times, and this gives you a, a good distribution over F2 scores, right? So you're counting up the number of true positives, false positives, false negatives, and, uh, and so this gives you a distribution over which you can then take the mean, and this gives you your set of Merrill scores, essentially. Um, and then the Merrill scores are taken as a blueprint of which, which of the algorithms you actually want to use on the metric. Yeah, so we can just go ahead and review what the architecture looks like at this point. Um, we still have our in-house telemetry system, M3, and we still have our in-house anomaly detection system, F3, but now M3 will first ask Merrill, hey, which algorithm is, is best suited for this particular metric? And then I'll go and sort of apply that in F3. And what this enables is a future vision in which alert configuration tools like one that my team is building called Synoptic will be able to have essentially automated alert generation. So in this case, you might have a metric. This is from Mutley. Mutley's current throughput. Mutley is our routing and service discovery system. Um, and you essentially just want to create an alert. And you can click a button and you can do that. And if you're a power user, you can set your own thresholds and do all sorts of custom configurations. But if you're not, you essentially only need to press an anomaly detection button. And that button's going to be powered by everything that you just heard about in this talk. Um, right now, sort of alert creation is a necessary and very important, but somewhat tedious and burdensome part of being a service owner. And we're really hoping that with Merrill and with some other um, initiatives that my team is putting through, that that's no longer going to be the case very soon. Thank you very much.